This is the Drew Mariani Show on Relevant Radio. All right, 14 minutes before the hour. Welcome back, everybody. Great to be here with you today. I can't stress enough how important it is to forgive. You know, these are such powerful stories. I don't know how many of you remember the shooting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, of an Amish schoolhouse and how the Amish offered forgiveness uh, to the, uh, not only to the man who did that, but how he comforted, they comforted uh, the, the, the widow of that man. Because I think the man ultimately took his life. Immaculate Ili Bigiza, uh, another woman whose family was slaughtered over in Rwanda, Africa, spent 91 days in a uh, in a bathroom with seven or eight or nine other women, uh, forgave the very people who killed her family. And I was here with Father Rubodo Ruta Rutangango. He's a Rwandan priest. And his story was especially moving to me. He too um, could not forgive uh, when the genocide broke out. The uh, the Hutus, they, they killed his entire family. He was forced to leave the country. He ended up in Lourdes. And when in Lourdes, France, he was praying, he heard a voice. Uh, it was the voice of our, of our Lord telling him to forgive those who did this to him. And he returned to Rwanda ultimately. And as the you know, genocide ended and the perpetrators were arrested, uh, he actually went into the very prison, forgave the man who killed his mother and his father and his brothers and his family. He lost literally dozens and dozens of family members in this genocide. Uh, and he vowed to take care of the very man who term, who destroyed, exterminated his family. He is now helping to raise the children of that man. And he's actually, you know, providing for their education and, and for their shelter. That's true forgiveness. Forgiveness, ladies and gentlemen, does not mean that we have to forget. If you're being abused right now, uh, if you're in a situation where you need to get out of it, I want to strongly encourage you to do that. There is a big thing. Forgiveness is not excusing an unjust behavior. It's acknowledging the unjust behavior is without excuse, but also meeting it with love and with mercy. My guest today, Dr. Bob Enright, uh, an expert in this field, perhaps one of the foremost in our country. Uh, He's written five books on this, over 120 different publications, and of course, one of the great professors of educational psychology at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison. Uh, doctor, let, let's pick up on that point, and then we'll grab a few quick calls here. Uh, forgiveness is not necessarily about forgetting, is it, or excusing an unjust behavior? That's right, because forgiveness is always centered in the courageous idea that I have been treated unjustly, and what happened to me will always be unjust, but I will have a new response to it, a merciful response, as the priest did in Rwanda, as you had just said. Yeah. And it's not the same as reconciliation, either. We can forgive. In other words, we offer a cessation of resentment. We offer goodness as best we can, and as that develops, we might be surprised that we can actually offer a love to this person, like the priest who is raising the children of the murderer. That's, that's love. That's a agape love. That's the self-sacrificial love. But we don't necessarily then come together again with the boyfriend or girlfriend. You don't necessarily come together again with the employer who's abusive. And so you can offer this goodness from within, because that's what a virtue is. It's the offer of goodness from within that flows out for others' benefit without necessarily coming together again in mutual trust. And when people understand that, they relax a little bit because they they realize they're not being asked to go back into abusive or perhaps even life-threatening situations. Uh, Doc, let's go take a few quick calls. We'll take them from around the country. I only have the good doctor, maybe 10 minutes at the most, maybe not even that. But we'll start on the beautiful East Coast, Wilmington, North Carolina. Hi, Jim. Hi, Drew. Drew, thank you for taking my call. Hello, doctor. You're welcome. Uh, Hi, Jim. This, this subject is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Drew, I've been on your show a couple of times talking about my own experience. Uh, just real briefly, I was molested by a priest. Yep. And... The point that I really want to make is it was only through God's grace that I was able to forgive him. And it was through much prayer and really begging that 
I, I mean, I literally felt God touch me, and so much sadness mm. was was taken away instantly. And um, I, I also have experience with lack of forgiveness, and it really, really brings about a lot of a lot of sadness and and destruction, um, alcoholism sex abuse, relationship abuse, um, on and on and on. Uh, Jim, let me pick up on that point. Jim has a very powerful story. He went on to forgive and has found freedom as a result of it. But, Doctor, uh, he brings up a, a great point that we have not talked about. For those right now who say, I don't want to forgive. I, you know, this person has hurt me. I will never forgive them. And I see this in a lot of these court cases where, you know, the, the, the family members of some victim uh, will go up and t- right to the perpetrator, will tell them how they'll never forgive them, how they hope they rot in hell. What, what's the... What's the byproduct of unforgiveness? We know there's freedom and healing uh, with with forgiveness, and, and it really is a conscious act. I mean, it's something that we are mandated to do. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. That's what forgiveness is. But a lot of people can't make that step. When they fail to, to harbor unforgiveness, what's that do physiologically, psychologically? What, what's the byproduct of all that? Well, in this new book, The Forgiving Life, I talk about some of these outcomes of forgiveness and non-forgiveness. And we do see characteristically that when people do not forgive the huge injustices against them, not just the everyday slights, but the big ones, there is a tendency for emotional compromise, such as anxiety and low self-esteem. There's a tendency to oftentimes be pessimistic about one's future. Uh, There can be uh, physiological changes in the body, uh, such as blood pressure creeping up because of anger, and there is a correlation between the two. But we also have to keep in mind that when people say, I will not forgive, that's not necessarily their final word. People change their mind, in other words. So we have to be gentle with those who say, I will never forgive, because it really is their call, just like It's their call whether to give to the local charity or not. It doesn't make them bad people. It makes them wounded people, and there's a big difference. And so I can gently encourage someone to forgive, but sometimes we have to simply wait for that, and tomorrow might be a better day for them. Right. Hey, Jim, what made you forgive? Drew, I was was tired of of the sadness that was always with me. Um, This is totally oversimplifying, but um, from my my own personal experience and my observations of of uh, someone who's very near and dear to my heart, uh, lack of forgiveness either breeds sadness or anger. And I was the sad hurt guy, and I, I honestly I was just tired of the weight of the sadness that was always with me. Wow, wow beautiful said, Jim. Thank you for that, and Doctor. Um... I love his story. That's the thing. I mean, you, if you want to heal, on the top of the hour, we always pray the chaplet here. Uh, if you really want God's grace to flow and you want to be able to move on, you have to make that step. Is there some advice you'd give to people about maybe one, two, three things they can do? Because I, I, I know it really is more of an act of the will. Somebody had burned me one time in a business deal that I was working on. I really trusted this person, and they sold me out to everybody, really misrepresented me. In the end, their mistruth came to light, but for about a year and a half, two years, I was really, um, I, I really suffered, and I really harbored animosity to this person. It was only, and I, I couldn't get beyond it. It was only until after I began to pray for that person and say, "Lord, I do not feel in my heart this forgiveness. I don't even really want to do this, but because you mandate it, because this is what I am called to do, like you." I forgive this person. And I began to pray for that person. And what I found happened is soon that chain that bound me to the person broke. And I no longer had these feelings of resentment. I no longer had this anger. I no longer had this sense of betrayal from that person. So when we begin this forgiveness process, if so, and I'm, my situation is minimal compared to what some people listening right now have gone through, you know, w- what are the steps that we should take to really get beyond the emotion of this and begin that healing process? Well, I think a key, as we point out in the book, The Forgiving Life, is we have to begin seeing the other person as wounded rather than as evil incarnate. And one way to do that is to see yourself at the foot of the cross, Jesus dying for you, and then put the other person who has hurt you gravely at the foot of the cross, just as in need of Jesus' redemption as you are. 
you are wounded by your own sins and they are wounded by theirs. And as you put that person at the foot of the cross, you begin seeing them in new ways, much more broadly than the one offense against you. And it can begin softening your heart. And another key is what we call in this book, again, The Forgiving Life, bearing the pain of what happened to you so that you don't throw that pain back to the person or to others who don't deserve it. And the bearing the pain, again, can have a Christ image. Jesus bore the pain of the cross, and we basically are being crucified when we are treated very, very unfairly by others. And so we can begin seeing that this is, in essence, an opportunity to suffer with Christ on his cross for the one who has hurt us. So put the person at the foot of the cross first and see them as wounded in need of Christ's redemption, and then put yourself on the cross with Christ and suffer for the other. And those very well might help turn a person's heart around toward a merciful response, which is forgiveness. The other thing people need to to recognize, too, is that there is a, uh, as horrible as the situation may seem, you know, the hurt, the anger, the betrayal, the victimization, whatever uh, you've gone through, by uniting your suffering to that of Christ, it becomes redemptive. And maybe you could talk, I only have about a moment or two left, doctor, but redemptive suffering is something overlooked, and I think it needs to be talked about more. This also helps in the healing process. Yes. John Paul II's apostolic letter, Salvifici Dolores, really talks about suffering being elevated to another level. It's a dignified level when we use our suffering to help others. And you can actually help the one who hurt you by uniting with Christ through his grace, and their hurting you could be an opportunity for that person to have eternal salvation because of your suffering with Christ for them. So in other words, the deepest level of forgiveness is very profound because your suffering can help save that other person. Doctor, let me sneak one last call. And kind of an interesting question here. They've been on hold here. Anonymous joins us out of Wisconsin. Anonymous, you got to make it kind of quick, okay? Okay, I will try. Um, my husband left me a few years ago for another woman, mm. and I feel like over the years I have gotten pretty well close to having forgiven him. I, you know, I fail at that sometimes, but for the most part, I feel like I've done the things that the doctor's talking about. Um, A question I have, though, he is still extremely hostile to me. He won't speak to me even. Um, His girlfriend also just hostile, you know, and I don't know if it would help for me to let him know that I have forgiven him or if Mm -hmm. I just... Good question. If I just continue to let it go the way it is and... (laughs) <laughs> the doctor, your, your thoughts for her, and we have less than a minute right now, but uh, do you tell the person who hurt you that you've forgiven them? It all depends on how they will respond. You can show rather than tell by a smile, by a return phone call, by showing this kind of love and concern. And I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about the love of Christ for this person, where you are concerned about him and his girlfriend. So you don't necessarily have to say anything. If you think it will help, fine. If not, continue showing this kind of sacrificial love, and it will get their attention. Yeah, and, and you can forgive even their nastiness, too, not just what happened originally. Right, and that's what I feel like I tried to do, and I try to offer that up for him so that hopefully he will see that if I'm not reacting the way he might be expecting, that hopefully he will see. He, he, you know what, Anonymous? I, I would tell him. Let him know. He might plant that seed. All right, uh, got to take a quick break here. Doctor, I want to thank you for being with us. Your book is available, I'm assuming, at Amazon. and Amazon. Uh, yeah, The Forgiving Life. The Forgiving Life. Sounds great. Always a delight having you. I hope it sells out. A number of other books on forgiveness, too. So if you're really struggling, check out Dr. Robert Enright, okay? I'm Drew Mariani, back with more in just a moment.